Okay, today's video is about aquatic diversity. So we're going to talk about what goes on in the water. Three quarters of the planet's surface covered with water. So we're going to talk very briefly about all that goes on in that three quarters of space on our planet. Okay, so the uh, case study at the beginning is about coral reefs. So we should uh, understand about the coral reefs for sure. There are many reasons that the coral reefs are important to us and uh, not the least of which is they are a large place of biodiversity. So lots of biodiversity going on in the coral reefs. They are like the rainforests of the ocean. Uh, so there's reason to protect them for sure. Uh, people like going out to the coral reefs, of course. I've been to one before, which was a really nice scuba diving trip, and they do some ecological surfaces for us as well. And um, so you can read the list there, of course, but I want to talk a little bit more about the coral reefs here and about what we've been doing to the coral reefs. So for one thing, we have um, been overfishing in the area, so we're taking the resources that are there at an, a rate that is uh, not necessarily sustainable. And of course, there's the pollution associated with what we do. These coral reefs aren't very far off the shore, and uh, we can affect them. One of the things that I would have you know is something called coral bleaching. Now, coral is a symbiotic relationship. There is a calcium carbonate skeleton, and on top of that grows the algae that gives it its color. And the algae is what is uh, put in jeopardy due to the ocean temperatures. This algae has a uh, narrow range of tolerance, and when the temperatures get too high, they die off, and we get the coral bleaching. The ocean acidity has something to do with the skeletons, the calcium carbonate skeletons that are forming, and the acidity in, uh, interferes with that. And here is the way it happens. I've got a diagram for you that you won't find in the book, a little bonus there. So when the um, uh, carbon dioxide is absorbed by the water, because the water can absorb a lot of carbon dioxide, the extra carbon dioxide will form carbonic acid. So that carbonic acid is really taking the place of, uh, when it's forming the carbonic acid, of what the calcium could connect with, the calcium carbonate. And that's what forms the skeleton. So here is a chemical reaction that shows you, you know, if there's not enough of that uh, CO3 to go around, then, uh, then we're in a little bit of jeopardy there as far as being able to form those skeletons in the first place. So there you go, the two things that uh, are really uh, jeopardizing the coral reefs. And of course the coral reefs are beautiful. Here's a drawing of one, and I certainly enjoyed the one I visited. And then the one in the inset there is bleached out and uh, obviously not doing what we want it to do. Okay, so, um, all right, as I said before, most of the Earth is covered in water. So when we talk about the uh, water, we can talk about the marine zones, which are salt water, which is the most of it, and the uh, fresh water. The marine, of course, is the oceans, and the estuaries are where the rivers, the fresh water, meets the ocean. And um, so that's going to be also salt water. And these occur, these estuaries at the coastlines and the shorelines, that's where they affect us. And we'll talk some about the coral reefs and the mangrove forests. And in addition, we'll talk about the freshwater, the lakes, rivers, and streams, and the wetlands uh, that are going to affect us. Okay, so here is a picture of the big blue ball, mostly water. And uh, there you go, in the ocean hemisphere, half of the globe there, you can see it's pretty much all water. And there you go. Okay, so this is the idea. You can see now in green where the mangrove forests are. The coral reefs are in red, and they are in mostly tropical areas. So there's a temperature range that we're talking about, and uh, the mangrove forests as well. So those are a couple of the things that we're talking about there. And you can see here in the United States, we have some of the largest lakes in the world uh, with our system of what we call the Great Lakes. Okay, so what are we talking about here? In the ocean, in the saltwater area, there are going to be layers. And the top layer is going to get enough light for photosynthesis. There's going to be a lot of dissolved oxygen there, and a lot of uh, life can live right in there. 
In the middle zone, you're talking about an area with less dissolved oxygen and not too many nutrients around either. So there's not as much life there. And then there is the bottom, the bottom of the uh, ocean, which may surprise you to find out has lots of life. There's not lots of dissolved oxygen down there, but there are lots of nutrients. And these nutrients are falling from the top, from gravity. And they're not as fast as they would on land or through the air, but they drift down and they get the rather uh, poetic name of uh, marine snow. And this amounts to a lot of nutrients being at the bottom. The uh, nutrients will come to the top at areas of upwelling, and we'll talk about that as well. So here, the plankton, and lots and lots of plankton there, these are really small, uh, microscopic in some cases, organisms that are living there, and they start the food chain in the marine systems. And the phytoplankton is important because they are producing oxygen, and they go through photosynthesis. So the phytoplankton are responsible for roughly half of the oxygen in the atmosphere of the Earth. So that's pretty important for very small objects to be... Uh, to be doing that. Okay, so here are some of the things that we would talk about, as I said, whether there's light, what the temperatures are, how much dissolved oxygen so that the fish can breathe underwater with their gills, and the availability of the foods, the nutrients to create a food chain. Okay, so in these three zones that we're talking about, first of all, there's the coastal zone, and the coastal zone has lots of photosynthesis and lots of net primary productivity. So there is lots there uh, to draw species in, and there are well-developed food chains and food webs. The open sea has lots of uh, phytoplankton in it, so it is uh, you know, important as far as developing the ocean. And again, the open sea is going to be separated into the three layers that I talked about. And then there's the ocean bottom as well, which is uh, has a lot of life on it. Okay, so these are some of the things that uh, these systems do for us. They absorb the CO2. I've talked about the nutrient cycling. The marine snow drifts down. The currents will take it to other places. And then in places of upwelling, they'll bring them back up again. Uh, the ocean can handle. It's pretty big. It can handle a bunch of waste, maybe not as much as we've put in there. But these wetlands, these naturally occurring wetlands, and the islands and the mangrove swaps will keep storm impacts down. Uh, apparently, for one every one mile of wetlands that is undeveloped, it'll slow wind speeds by 10 miles per hour, and that's significant when the storms hit. And uh, there we go, and we really enjoy them. Uh, most, only uh, uh, 80%, I guess, of the world's population lives right near the ocean, and they like it. And we'll talk more about these things in the upcoming slides. Okay, so here are the zones split up for you. There's the idea of where the shoreline is, and that's the coastal zone. And then you can see the open sea, lots of life there at the top level, smaller things available in the middle, and then in the deep ocean there is not as much light and yet very different kind of species there. Very interesting stuff. So there you go with the different zones of the ocean, and you can see the different type of life that would live there. Okay, so um, we are talking about the idea of wetlands as well, and these wetlands that are near the rivers are very important, and they're great for agriculture, and we figured that out and developed them for the agriculture. The rivers bring all the nutrients in there, and you have a place where you can grow a lot of things, and naturally a lot of things grow as well, which amount to habitats, uh, but we've taken over a lot of that for our own uses. Okay, and uh, on the coastline here we have these seagrass beds, and they do, if we don't remove them, we'll cut down on the wave impact as they come in, slow things as they come through. Okay, so there are a lot of things that we'll do, as we talked about before. They will uh, help with the water quality here, these wetlands will. They'll take out some pollutants. They will um, provide things that we need, storm damage, cutting down on coastal erosion. So there are lots of uses here for the wetlands before we take them over for our own uses. Lots of things that are valuable to us that we do sacrifice when we decide to develop them for things like agriculture. Okay, so here is an estuary system here, and what you're seeing now is all the sediments and the erosion that are coming down the rivers toward the ocean. And that's got something to do with how we've developed the areas and how we've used them.
So that's the idea there. Okay, very rich in life, as I said here. So you can see there are well-developed food chains, and it's really kind of nice to spend some time down there and, and take a look at everything that's going on. But uh, pretty amazing uh, systems there. And here in New Jersey, where we have class, uh, we're close by. So there are lots of places that we can go to, lots of national preserves that we can go to, and uh, some beaches that are there, of course, for tourism as well. We've got a, a wealth of that here in New Jersey. The Jersey Shore is pretty well known for those areas. And as you go up and down the coast, you can see some very interesting areas as well. So there you go. All right, and here's a person enjoying those wetlands, and I certainly have before too. And uh, very nice, pretty amazing what nature has to offer. Okay, here are the mangroves that we were talking about. So maybe you didn't know what they were talking about when they said mangroves. So here's a picture of the mangrove trees. And uh, yeah, they've been jeopardized a lot for shrimp farming. That's uh, the area that shrimp farming needs to be in, so that takes down the mangrove forests, and we've cleared off the mangrove forests. But there's a lot of habitat there, and they're very good for keeping the shoreline intact. And so we have done that at the, well, at the trade-off of uh, having less of that protection, that natural pr uh, protection. Okay, so the intertidal zone is going to be, uh, sometimes they're going to be covered with water, and sometimes they're not. You've got an in-between area there. So you can imagine you've got animals that have to be able to uh, grab onto things or dig into the sand when the waves are coming to get away. Uh, we like watching the uh, watching that go on, the sand crabs. And they've got all kinds of interesting uh, adaptations and have to have a wide range of tolerance because sometimes it's going to be saltier, sometimes it's going to be uh, freshwater, and there's going to be lots of changes going on during the day and during the year in these areas. The sand dunes that we like to develop on because people would like a nice view of the ocean. It's so beautiful. Um, but these sand dunes, people don't like them because they block the views of their homes for the ocean that they were trying to see. But they do have a nat natural uh, buffer when the storms come in. So we get rid of the sand dunes. We get rid of that protection as well. And that's the idea of the sand dunes. So here are some of the uh, animals that are adapted to hanging around where the tide is coming in. And uh, they have to also be now adapted to uh, the people that are going to be there as well. Because people sure do like to spend a lot of time right there on the shoreline. Okay, so this is the idea of a rocky beach. And here is more of a barrier beach. And there you go. Pretty fascinating stuff here. Uh, yeah, shores along the Pacific Ocean look uh, very different in the California coast, at least that I've been up and down, than the coast that we have here. Ours look more like the barrier beaches, and they have the rocky shore beaches, but uh, fascinating all the way around. And uh, these species have to be adapted to those changing conditions. Okay, so here's an idea of the sand dunes and the protection they offer, and it's a little safer to be dealing on the back dunes by the bays, um, but, you know, there you can see that the natural dune would take off your view of the ocean, and the view of the ocean is desirable. So, that's the limitation there. Okay. And I already said that they are similar to the rainforests, and there's another statistic for you. One-fourth of all marine species at the coral reefs, so that's a lot. So here's an idea of some of the food chains that would be going on at the uh, coral reefs. And you can see there is a lot going on there. and People do like to see that. And there you go. Phytoplankton starting the food chain. These are the producers in the food chain. And there you go. That's a pretty good uh, description of it all. All right. And then, uh, of course, we could talk, as I already have, about the different species that you would find here in the different zones. So this has already been covered in a slide where we got to see it. I've already mentioned marine snow, so we understand that there are nutrients that are being brought down. Currents will take them around. We've discussed uh, oceanic currents in another chapter, and upwellings will bring them back up to the surface. And we've talked about the upwellings before as well. Okay, so what are the big things that are, you know, putting them in jeopardy? Well, there you go, our development. We like to have our houses there. We like the uh, fishing. We have uh, pollution that we're putting in there. We're destroying their habitats. We've introduced invasive species, raising the sea level with climate change, apparently. 
and uh, the pollution of these different areas. So we're doing that in a big way. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, this is a good one to be taking a look at. It is not too far from here. And here, I bet you already from our conversations can get an idea of what the problem is with the phosphate and nitrate levels too high. And hopefully you already know a little bit about the causes of that, what we've had to do with that. Agriculture being a big part of that. And the uh, boost up in algal blooms is one of the uh, things that we have to talk about with the phosphate and nitrates going. Cultural eutrophication, in two words, which we've discussed a couple of times already. Okay, so the Chesapeake Bay, uh, now the, and I actually think in, uh, you know, it was uh, really degraded for a while, and I think it might be coming back this summer, and I'm making this video in 2017, so it's always good to try to keep up with the latest information on all of these things. But uh, this summer there were uh, lots of dolphin sightings in the Chesapeake Bay, so perhaps that's a sign that the Chesapeake Bay is coming back. Uh, and there we go. And here's the idea of where it is. So it's a big area going along the eastern sea coast. And there you go, Chesapeake Bay. Um, some of you may have been across the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, which is an amazing feat of engineering. Miles and miles of uh, bridge and then tunnel. And it's a bridge and tunnel combination. It takes you a while to get over that bridge tunnel. And if you've been over it, you know what I'm talking about. And I'm, I'm guessing some of you have. Uh, all right, so now we get onto fresh water. So there are lakes, ponds, and inlands. So we'll call those lentic bodies of water. They're uh, standing, and streams and rivers are the lotic, the flowing um, systems of water. So that's the idea over there. And we can talk about the different zones in the lakes as they uh, form. And this is another thing that the AP folks would have you know about, the different zones here. So you should be familiar with them. And here they are in a description for you. The littoral zone is right near the, the shore. And then the limnetic zone is where you get the most photosynthesis and probably the most activity going on as well. And then the profundo and the benthic zone. So similar to the layers of the... Um, the layers of the ocean, of the marine systems. These uh, lakes also have similar setups. Okay, so these lakes are good for lots of different things and habitats, biodiversity, uh, controlling flood if we do them properly, and nutrient cycling. We use them for our water. We use them for our agriculture. We use them to generate electricity with hydroelectricity. We use them to move goods and services around. We use them for recreation because it's fun to be around them. And uh, we also uh, have a lot of employment involved in that. So there you go. Okay, so there are different lakes here, oligotrophic lakes. I always think of uh, Crater Lake, which was formed from a crater, and all the fresh water came up, so there were low levels of nutrient, completely blue, completely clear water. Eutrophic lakes are um, levels that have high levels of nutrients, and uh, that's where you start getting into the idea of culture, uh, algae blooms that might be a little bit too much of a thing. That's the hypo-eutrophic, uh, and mesotrophic is somewhere in the middle, and that's probably where you want to be. Okay, so there is an oligotrophic uh, setting there, beautiful crisp blue waters, and there is uh, hyper-eutrophication where you have amazing uh, algae blooms. So there's the difference in picture form for you. Okay, so um, the uh, water comes from the mountains to the ocean, so this de uh, depends on gravity. Gravity to bring the water down in the first place, and then the gravity of running downhill to bring it to the ocean. So downhill running of the water is pretty important to us, and it brings all this nutrients with it as well, and uh, that's what we're talking about there. So um, the other thing is the uh, thaw. So there'll be uh, freezes of ice and lots of moisture will be uh, trapped there. And then we rely on the spring thaw to uh, bring all of that stuff down. There are three uh, zones that we could be talking about. So that's the source zone up in the mountains. And then there is the tributaries uh, and floodplains that are in the transition zone. And then you are down to the estuary area, also the uh, delta, I guess you could call that. And that's where all the nutrients settle out. So there's lots of great growing there. Of course, when you try to settle in those areas, you're settling in a floodplain. And uh, that gets people in trouble, too, because they are building their homes where it is going to naturally be a flood. So there's the idea of how the water gets to the ocean and a little bit of the uh, water cycle for us. 
Okay, so we have done a lot to try to change things over for our benefit and try to make them work for us. And maybe in some of these cases, we're talking about anthropogenic, uh, you know, things that we've done as people that are worsening storms and things that would come in. Uh, so that's the idea. I've already talked about the mangrove forests and how we've developed on these things. So we're taking away our natural protection. For the dams, we can cut down on the amount of flooding. Maybe we can control where and when the water's coming, but that does come cut into the uh, migratory paths of some fish, that cuts into the amount of sediments that'll get down, and of course that'll change the dynamics of how things are going. Um, the big storm here when the book was uh, written was the Katrina down in New Orleans, which is pretty devastating, but that's already 12 years ago at the time of this video is making, and we have another storm that we could be talking about, um, and we know a little bit more about, and that's Sandy. But here was the deal on uh, New Orleans, and when we had seen these pictures, uh, I spent some time down there. I have some relatives in the area, and uh, when we see these pictures, I think we're kind of removed from them. Going down there really opened my eyes to how much damage was done and how long it was going to take to repair all that damage. But that's a pretty crazy thing to think of. Like all of those uh, places where people lived now flooded out completely. And again, at the time this book was written, uh, that was something that we were up here in New Jersey a little less familiar with than we are now. So this is the idea of the sea levels rise. New Orleans is really built below sea level. They've done some pretty inventive things to keep their city going, but built below sea levels has some drawbacks as well. And, um, okay, so here we go. And as I've said a bunch of times, these different things that are going on in these areas are very helpful to us. Prairie potholes to let the water flow through. And again, these are areas that we have... Uh, developed, but they soak up a lot of the water and that's going to keep the flooding from happening and then it adds to the groundwater that's also important to us and we'll talk about it in another chapter. All right, so these do uh, great things for us and uh, we've talked about these before too, so uh, let's get a look at them on the screen there and I think you'll see that each one of these has been uh, talked about before. Here we're talking about them in terms of the inland wetlands, so these are in a little bit farther uh, these are away from the coast, but really the same kind of things that we do for, uh, that they uh, do for us, and also makes them you know desirable to develop on as well. Okay, so as I said, the dams and canals. I've talked about how that can work, and okay, and we've, we've really talked about all of these things before. Okay, so why am I repeating them again? I don't know. And uh, there we go. These are the reasons that we have lost the uh, inland wetlands in the United States. And that's uh, caused some problems with flooding and droughts as well. And we've done it for agriculture, mining, forestry, for extracting oil and gas, building highways and urban development. And, uh, and now we're finding out a little bit what the effect of, uh, of that would be. And that's all I have for you for Chapter 8. I hope this was helpful. And I look forward to seeing you back in class.